is CGTN, China Global Television Network. UK Parliament reopens to a heated debate as government says it will ask for a vote on an election soon. Algeria begins probe on a hospital fire that left eight newborn babies dead. And the Democratic Republic of Congo to begin using second Ebola vaccine next month after approval by experts. Hello and a warm welcome to Africa Live. I am Penina Karibe and in studio with me is Rama with the day's business headlines. That's right, Penina. Here's what's coming up in the course of the hour. South Africa's central bank has raised the red flag about a pace of state borrowing that's much faster than forecast. And Nigeria's partial closure of its border with Benin has disrupted trade across the region. We'll explore that and plenty more in the course of the hour. But first, the latest in current affairs with Benin. Thank you, Rama. Now we begin in the UK, where there have been angry exchanges in Parliament as the House resumed sittings a day after Tuesday's Supreme Court ruling. The verbal confrontation follows Attorney General Geoffrey Cox's Wednesday's utterances, in which he termed the House as a dead Parliament and a disgrace. In the session, Cox pushed the election agenda as members sought answers on how the House was prorogued and whether the Queen was misadvised by the Prime Minister. Parliament has to determine the terms on which we leave. But this Parliament has declined three times to pass a Withdrawal Act with which the opposition in relation to the Withdrawal Act had absolutely no objection. And it was then we now have a wide number of this House setting its face against leaving at all. Yep, yep. And when this government draws the only logical inference from that position, which is that it must leave therefore without any deal at all, it still sets its face, denying the electorate the chance of having its say, its say in how this matter should be resolved. This parliament is a dead parliament. It should no longer sit. It has no moral right to sit on these green benches. I came into the chamber today thinking I felt sorry for the Attorney General. But as he started, I did. Fair enough. But every word he has uttered, no shame today, no shame at all. The fact that this government cynically manipulated the prorogation to shut down this House so that it couldn't work as a democratic assembly. He knows that that is the truth. Yeah. And to come here with these barristers bluster, yeah. to obfuscate the truth, and for a man like him, a party like this, and a leader like this, this prime minister, to talk about morals and morality yeah. is a disgrace. I'm not sure I could discern in that marshmallow of, of rhetoric, <laughs> any actual question. <laughs> but, but in so far, there was a question. There's an answer. If the, if the honorable gentleman thinks that the government should no longer be governing, tell his leader to bring a motion of no confidence this afternoon. Tell his leader to agree to a simple one-line statute that fixes the election by a simple majority and we would be delighted to meet him wherever he chooses in front of the electorate who will judge whether the machinations which he supports and the devices he resorts to in order to make sure this dead parliament continues are right or wrong Opposition members have stated that they will only back an election if the government complies with a law passed by Parliament which forces the Prime Minister Boris Johnson to request a delay to Brexit with the European Union. The Prime Minister has been insisting on the UK leaving the EU with or without a deal. Now let's get you more on the dramatic events in the British Parliament. I'm joined live from London by CGTN's Andrew Wilson for more on this. Andrew, you followed this session today. What was the biggest news from there at the end of the day? 
I think what's extraordinary about what happened today is that uh, we had this ruling from the Supreme Court uh, that the prorogation, the suspension of Parliament was illegal and void. Parliament brought itself back together again quickly this morning from 11 o'clock and you saw the language in that clip there. Both sides are furious with each other. Both sides absolutely furious. The government furious because the Supreme Court denied its move to suspend Parliament and made the Prime Minister look ridiculous. And the MPs furious because uh, government tried to have them removed from uh, the House of Commons at a time when they felt they had an awful lot to say to the government. And you saw the resumption, simply a resumption, of the discussions that were taking place before Parliament was suspended. But this time the temperature is double. It's much higher. People are furious with each other in the House of Commons and it will take some time for that to die down to a more reasonable debate again. Uh, so the government is saying, Andrew, it will ask MPs to vote on an election. How practical would this be before October the 31st? It's complicated this point, but it's very important to understand. The government would happily have an election right now. Now, you saw Geoffrey Cox in that clip just now, the Attorney General, goading the opposition, using the kind of language, defying them and saying, look, if you want to disagree with us, why not have an election? Because the government knows it wants the call for an election to come from the other side. The rules about fixed parliaments make it difficult for the Prime Minister to call an election. There would be a delay of two weeks before it would start, and also he needs a two-thirds majority on his side to have that election go ahead, so he pretty much can't do it. So he's trying to go the opposition into calling for an election themselves. They won't do that for the simple reason that Brexit must be decided by 31st of October. And parliamentarians of the opposition are determined that there should be a deal by then. And they don't want an election being called in case a no deal slips through on 31st of October. So before that happens, before any election happens, they want to make sure that the rules stopping no deal on 31st of October are watertight, that the government cannot slip in a no deal uh, withdrawal from the European Union. That's their prime motivation. Until that happens, they don't want to have an election. Now, the government wants an election because the Prime Minister still believes he has a mandate out there in the country that supports him. He believes that if push comes to shove in an election, he can persuade the country that the parliamentarians are not acting in people's interests, that they are a parliamentary elite sided with the judiciary as well, and that they are plotting to keep the country inside the European Union. He believes that narrative would carry it for him in a general election, but he can't call it himself. All right, so what next for him then, Andrew? Well, now the, pri the Prime Minister has to decide in his mind and with his own people in Downing Street where they go next, how they move things forward, because thus far his strategies have not worked well. He's had six votes rejected in the House of Commons since he became Prime Minister. 21 MPs from his party have been fired or have resigned on the grounds of rebelling against government policy. And some of those MPs are very influential members of Parliament who've been in uh, Parliament all their lives, a lot longer than this Prime Minister for a start. And now, of course, he's been uh, turned down by the Supreme Court and, and judged as uh, acting illegally when he suspended Parliament. He's got a lot to get over. He's got a lot of face to restore, if you like, back in the House of Commons. Now, he's going to try and do that when he finally addresses MPs himself, and then he's going to allow the debate to, debate to start again, and he's probably going to start promising that he can make a deal with the European Union. The problem is, then we go to Brussels, and as far as the European Parliament is concerned, Britain does not have enough in the bag yet to make a deal. They've got to work harder. It may turn out that the country will judge that the Prime Minister wasn't counting on having to make a deal at all, and he might find himself called by his own bluff. Either way, that will lead towards an extension, exactly what the Prime Minister didn't want. 31st of October gets cancelled and a new date decided further down the line to give Britain more time to decide how to make a deal with the European Union on leaving. Mm, it's quite a tough one for him, Andrew. Thank you for that. Andrew Wilson, live for us in London. Now, Iranian President Hassan Rouhani is ruling out negotiations with the U.S. over the nuclear issue. In his address to the 74th U.N. General Assembly, President Rouhani accused Washington of using threats and sanctions, while at the, st at the same time calling for talks. Based on this, he said his country would never sit down with people who were willing to compromise the future of Iran. He also warned that the Gulf is on the verge of collapse as tensions deepen and that a single blunder could fuel a huge fire.
Air. Rouhani has also termed economic sanctions imposed by the U.S. on Tehran as economic terrorism. His speech comes days after President Trump threatened more sanctions after accusing Tehran of involvement in attacks on Saudi oil facilities. And we have never surrendered to foreign aggression and imposition. We cannot believe the invitation to negotiation of people who claim to have applied the harshest sanctions of history against the dignity and prosperity of our nation. So your chance, Nick Harper is in New York. He joins us live from there for more on this. Nick, how has that statement by the Iranian president been received at the UN General Assembly by other nations? Well, really, it's been received as expected. The battle lines at the United Nations General Assembly are always very clearly drawn between Iran and the United States. And when Hassan Rouhani or the Iranian president in charge comes to give their speech, uh, we know that we're going to hear a lot of rhetoric against the US, but also looking to some of Iran's friends in the room. Hassan Rouhani mentioning by name Venezuela, Cuba, also Russia, saying that the United States had imposed harsh sanctions on those countries as well. But Yes, he labelled uh, the United States as being guilty of merciless economic terrorism and international piracy, saying that the US was silently killing Iran. And that was why he would never return to the negotiating table while those US sanctions remain in place. But remember, there's been a lot of work behind the scenes to try and broker a deal between the US and Iran, to try and get the Iranian nuclear agreement back on track, that agreement that the US and Donald Trump pulled out of last year. Hassan Rouhani accusing the US of hypocrisy from walking away from that deal. But the European leaders, including the French president uh, Emmanuel Macron, has been pushing hard to try and get that deal uh, back together, to try and get them around the negotiating table. But Hassan Rouhani making it very clear that will not happen while those US sanctions remain. And Nick, what else is coming out of the session today? Well, another big attack was from Ukraine against Russia. We heard for the first time the new Ukrainian president, Vladimir Zelensky, speaking to the UN uh, General Assembly, uh, saying that Russia had been guilty of many crimes against Ukraine, reminding the world of the annexation of Crimea back in 2014, in which Zelensky said 13,000 people had been killed and one and a half million people had been displaced. Uh, he said that his top priorities now were restoring Ukrainian territories and restoring peace to the country but he did say to do that he needed wide international support he also warned all the other world leaders what happened to his country could happen to other countries suggesting therefore that Russia could impose the same sort of aggression against other countries that were listening to that speech now Nick, events at the UN assembly were nearly overshadowed by the news of Trump's impeachment hearings how much can you tell us about that? That's right, about 24 hours ago, suddenly attention was turned away from New York and back to Washington, D.C., and yet President Trump was still here, and he remains here today. He will not be leaving until sometime uh, later on this evening. This all boils down to a phone call a couple of months ago with that president of Ukraine, President Zelensky, in which the Democrats say President Trump tried to push the Ukrainians to try and dig up some dirt on the potential Democrat opponent that Trump will be facing next year, Joe Biden. And doing so uh, by withholding military aid and financial aid in the region of about $400 million to Ukraine uh, in a prid quo pro deal, the Democrats are saying. Now, Trump uh, has said that that is not the case. He has released the transcript in the last few hours of that phone call, uh, and he has gone on to call it uh, one of the greatest witch hunts in American history. But of course, the Democrats have now started those official impeachment proceedings. They're looking into various different investigations, about half a dozen to see if uh, the president did try to enter into some sort of deal that would have benefited him at the expense of the American public and at the expense of Joe Biden and therefore holding, withholding that aid from Ukraine. It will be a long process in terms of impeachment, but at this stage, uh, the American president is saying that was not the case. One thing important to remember is that President Trump is due to meet 
President Zelensky. In just over an hour's time, the press will be there. They'll be asking many questions, undoubtedly, in the course of that bilateral meeting, wanting to try and get their response from both presidents on what we're hearing on this impeachment process. All right, Nick, thank you for that update. Nick Harper live in New York. To Algeria now, where the government has opened an inquiry into a fire at the maternity wing of a hospital in the eastern part of the country that left eight newborn babies dead. Some of them died from burns and others from inhaling smoke fumes. Eleven babies and over 100 adults were rescued from the blaze. CGTN's Asta Talk has this story. The blaze ripped through the hospital in the early morning hours in the city of Oud Souf southeast of the capital, Algiers. <laughs> Distraught locals gathered at the hospital's entrance in efforts to understand what exactly happened. Some of them could not hide their disappointment. Why is health in this region so catastrophic? What's the reason? They left my pregnant wife and she was about to give birth, waiting for three hours in the hallway while she was suffering. Why? This is a second fire at the hospital. Last year, a similar tragedy took place in May, but left no casualties. This time, eight newborn babies did not escape the snare of death. Is this how babies are treated? My God, Allah is the greatest. Allah is the greatest. The government has opened an inquiry to establish the circumstances surrounding the tragedy. Protests condemning neglect that led to the incident reflected the frustrations of locals in the area. The fire was contained and did not spread to other wards. The quality of government services has often been a cause of anger in Algeria, particularly in areas outside the capital. Astatal, CGTN. The Democratic Republic of Congo has announced it will begin using a second Ebola vaccine in October this year. The decision is, a bit, is in a bid to end the outbreak, which has killed more than 2,000 people since August last year. The introduction of the second experimental vaccine has been endorsed by an independent group of international health experts. CGTN's Chris Chamringa has more. A second Ebola vaccine will be introduced in the DRC in mid-October. The vaccine, manufactured by U.S. firm Johnson & Johnson, will be introduced in areas where the disease is not being actively transmitted. The current Merck vaccine being used proved effective in preventing the spread of the disease. But health experts recommended the introduction of another one. The current vaccine we are using on the ground, it is the RVSV, it is a Merck vaccine. It is for the, for the ring vaccination. It is not for the, a, a large population. So um, Johnson & Johnson, one of the advantages is, is we can use it for, for, for a large vaccination and also it is for the prevention. It is preventive vaccine. The new experimental vaccine is administered in two shots, about two months apart. Plans to introduce the vaccine sparked controversy mid this year. The former DRC health minister, Oli Ilunga, argued that it would cause confusion among the communities. But some doctors have welcomed the introduction of the vaccine. I am among many people from Eastern Congo who are happy about the plan to introduce the second vaccine. The announcement of the second Ebola vaccine comes as medical charity, Doctors Without Borders, accused the World Health Organization of rationing the first Ebola vaccine in the DRC. The World Health Organization has denied its rationing the vaccine and said it's working hard to end the outbreak in the DRC. The WHO and the DRC Health Ministry say more than 200,000 people have been vaccinated with the Merck vaccine since August last year. But the deadly virus has killed more than 2,000 people, making it the second deadliest outbreak after that seen in West Africa between 2014 and 2016. Chris Sochamringa, CGTN, Kinshasa, Democratic Republic of Congo. You're watching Africa Live. Let's take our first break this hour coming up. 
Almost 70 years of cooperation between China and Africa will look at the impact on Africa's economies. It is China time. Against the odds, the People's Republic of China was founded 70 years ago. Since then, it has aspired for change, both at home and abroad. What is driving this endeavor? And how has it managed to evolve with the times? We will look back. And in a new era, the nation is forging new missions and visions. We will look ahead. Tune in to our exclusive coverage of the 70th anniversary of the People's Republic of China. I've learned how to code in a simple way. Together with other young people, we are able to make this difference. Africa Live. Find your voice. The Chinese Embassy in South Africa has hosted a cultural celebration to mark the 70th anniversary of the founding of the People's Republic of China. A grand reception was held in honor of the anniversary. A number of South African cabinet ministers attended the event. CGT and Zulisan Jamila has more. The 1st of October 2019 marks the 70th anniversary of the founding of the People's Republic of China. This landmark day is being celebrated in the People's Republic of China and in different parts of the world. It's an opportunity to celebrate with the Chinese peoples and also recognize that country's achievements. China was once a poor and bad country has become the second worst, the world's second largest economic, the largest manufacturer, the largest trader in goods, and the largest holder of foreign reserve. China's GDP is five times of India, three times of Japan, and two thirds of American. China has become the main major engine driving the world economic development and contribute more than 30% of the world economic growth since 2006, more than all the developed countries together. South Africa ascribes great value to its relations with China. The relations have developed with time. It is thus fitting that this country also celebrates the 70th anniversary of the founding of the People's Republic of China. From a warm and cordial relationship to a comprehensive strategic partnership, one which has assumed depth based on understanding, cooperation, cultural affinity and mutual economic growth and developmental aspirations. China has also become the largest trading partner with more than 100 major countries in the world, including many countries on the African continent. China as a strategic partner in this country, in this continent, we not come here to complain. We come here to work together to see where's the problem. And how can we find a solution to work together to solve that problem? Due to the existing strong socio-economic relations between South Africa and the People's Republic of China, this grand reception was attended by a number of cabinet ministers, parliamentary representatives, as well as other important guests from different walks of life. South Africa once again expresses its gratitude to China for supporting the African Union's Agenda 2063 as the strategic framework for the socio-economic transformation of our continent over the next 50 years. In 2018, China and South Africa celebrated the 20th anniversary of the establishment of diplomatic relations between the two countries. 
This is the most elaborate and spectacular of the celebrations, but there are other events and activities that are due to take place around the country to continue to celebrate the 70th anniversary of the founding of the Republic of China. You're listening to Javela for CGTN in Pretoria, South Africa. Now, the Nigeria is set to increase capacity of its China-assisted railway service along the 186.5-kilometer Abuja-Kaduna rail line. 16 additional coaches and 10 locomotives are expected in the country by the end of the year to add to the existing ones. This is powered by rising demand in the service. As Kalechia Mekalam reports, many more passengers are opting for rail transportation for reasons of safety and comfort. The waiting lounge is packed full. Passengers have had to come here at least two hours earlier and even more just to secure a spot for their trip. More and more people now find the railway service a preferred means of transportation. When you are traveling by road, you'll be scared of accident, scared of kidnapping and the rest. But for this, it's very fast and it's very comfortable. You won't be scared of anything. Commissioned in July of 2016, the Abuja Rail Service has benefited many here. An average 3,500 passengers use this service daily, and Nigerians are hoping for an increase in capacity and expansion. Currently, there are two trains that ply the Abuja Kaduna route, each train originating from both locations. They have a total of 15 coaches and make eight trips daily but that is still not enough. We underestimated the patronage that we are currently having on this corridor because there is no day we don't carry to our full capacity for now. And uh, people are yearning for more rolling stock so that we can serve them better. The service has conveyed over 1.5 million passengers since operations commenced. However, the benefits of the rail transportation isn't just quantified in the revenue generated alone, but also in terms of the lives it has helped to develop. Over 800 direct employments and thousands more are indirect. Coming of railway into Abuja has really opened up this city and connected it to Kaduna and other cities too. You can find out that uh, with this project, the, 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 there is a massive uh, movement of passengers between the two cities. And this has also encourages and encouraged commerce and other businesses that are taking place. The service is expected to have a boost by year end. At the end of this year, there will be 10 more passenger locomotives and 60 coach will arrive to Nigeria. And uh, until now, now the uh, capacity, the monthly average capacity of the, the passenger flow is uh, more than 100,000. When the new locomotive and the coach arrive, the capacity will be double. Nigeria's railway has been in existence for over a hundred years, but the service went extinct following years of neglect and mismanagement. Now there's an entire concept of revitalizing it, a 25-year development plan. The Abuja Kaduna Railway project is just one part of a massive ongoing plan for a countrywide expansion one that's expected to cover over 3,000 kilometer track distance. Kilechia Mekalam, CGT in Abuja, Nigeria. Well, we're now joined by Dr. Nabil Nedim Eldin, an independent researcher and writer on international politics. His life for us in Cairo. Dr. Nabil, thank you very much for joining us. What is the impact of Chinese construction on Egyptian infrastructure development? Uh, thanks for having me. Yes, uh, I would like to start by congratulating. I would like to start by congratulating the uh, People's Republic of China for its uh, 70th anniversary, and uh, to emphasize that the diplomatic relation between Egypt and China goes back to almost uh, 50, 70 years ago, and uh, nowadays, since uh, President Sisi has taken over power in Egypt, 
which co-existed uh, 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 with the uh, China's uh, Built and uh, Road Initiative proposed 2013. The cooperation between China and Egypt has been boosted to some amazing level. And that uh, initiative has got uh, some uh, positive uh, repercussions on the Egyptian development plan. We have the, the, the uh, massive uh, Chinese uh, companies like uh, China State Construction Engineering Corporation, which is uh, implementing massive projects in the Egyptian new administrative capital. Uh, and one of them is building that uh, iconic uh, tower in the central uh, business district of the new uh, administrative uh, capital. And that iconic tower is going to be the highest building or the tallest building in Africa with 385 meters. Also, there is some Chinese projects in the energy uh, uh, sector uh, and the uh, China AVIC International uh, and Railway uh, Limited Company is building a light uh, railway to connect the new administrative uh, capital with the other uh, new cities around it. So we can see that the, the, the cooperation between China and Egypt is getting uh, really in the uh, uh, positive side to both countries, especially that Egypt is the gate to Africa and uh, President Sisi has uh, visited China five times since he took power 2014. I would like also to refer to the uh, exchange uh, trade between China and Egypt, which has uh, reached 13.87 billion in 2018. Egypt has exported almost 1.8 billion of products to China. So uh, briefly, I can say that the uh, Built and Road Initiative is working very positively in accordance with the Egyptian uh, development plans. All right, so we also now can bring in Johnson Chuku. He's the CEO uh, of Kauri Asset Management Limited, an investment bank in Lagos. Thank you very much uh, for joining us, Johnson. What about Nigeria? What is your assessment of the difference brought about by Chinese construction? Thank you for having me. I think Chinese construction has actually impacted uh, massively on Nigeria's infrastructure supply. If you look at the four areas, infrastructural areas, where the Chinese uh, funding and uh, technical competence has come in, which include the rail transport system, low transport system, aviation, telecommunication, and uh, power supply, the electric, electric power supply, we've seen a lot of landmark projects that have been built by Chinese uh, engineering firms in Nigeria, such as the Lagos Kaduna uh, Standard Gauge Rail, the ongoing construction of Lagos Ibadan, off upward to Kanu Standard Gauge Rail. We have the Lagos uh, Light Rail System that is under construction, the Abuja Light Rail System under construction, that is the rail sector. In the power sector, we have the Mambila Hydropower Plant under construction by the Chinese. Uh, we have the Gurara and we have the Zungere uh, power plants, all under construction by the Chinese. We have, in terms of aviation, we have about four airport terminals that we are built by the Chinese in Kanu, Lagos, Port Harcourt, and Abuja. And then we also have the Chinese footprints in the telecommunications center, uh, sector. Check for instance, the Nigerian communication satellite was built by the Chinese and lodged into the orbit. So we have a lot of impactful Chinese uh, infrastructure development in Nigeria in the past couple of years. All right, so um, Dr. Nabil coming to you, looking into the future, which areas do you see as the next frontier for cooperation between China and African countries? Uh, I believe very much that the potential in the African but in Afro-China uh, future relation is to concentrate on the African citizen. So 
developing the, the manpower, especially that a, a lot of the 54 African countries, they are suffering from high level of unemployment. Unemployment because the youth, the young men and women are not qualified to get jobs. I believe very much the potential uh, cooperation or the future cooperation between China and the African countries is to start with uh, 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 exchanging uh, skills and education, especially technical education. Uh, Africa has got almost 1.6 uh, billion uh, population, and the unemployment in Africa is quite high, especially uh, in the uh, uh, most troubled uh, parts of it. The other side of future cooperation between Africa and China is thus road and infrastructure projects. Uh, African states cannot exchange trade because they have to go around and the cost of uh, uh, moving goods is very high. So China, with its expertise and capabilities, should concentrate on connecting African states together. And that project of uh, Alexandria Cape Town Railway uh, should play a quite uh, 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 positive uh, role in this uh, part. Um, Johnson, coming to you, you're involved in asset management there in Lagos. How are the locals benefiting from this cooperation between China and Nigeria? Uh, interestingly, uh, most of the current cooperation between China and Nigeria are at the government-to-government -government level, where the Chinese government is supporting it for the Nigerian government. But beyond that, for the local business operators, uh, a few Nigerian businesses are engaging Chinese technology in the construction of their factories, uh, in a, such as the cement industry, where a lot of the cement manufacturing outfits actually relied on Chinese labor and competence to build the factories. We also seen a lot of business to business engagement between Nigerian businesses and Chinese businesses. And I think that's the direction it should be going. Because beyond the infrastructure, if we have to bring the benefits of the relationship between China and Nigeria to the common man on the street, it has to dovetail to a business to business engagement where we create work jobs and create economic benefit to the average citizens. So we're beginning to see that. We're beginning to see a lot of Nigerian leveraging and Chinese know-how to manage their business outfits, particularly the manufacturing sector, where China has proven its uh, competence globally. All right, thank you very much for joining us. Johnson Chukwu, live for us in Lagos, and in Cairo, Dr. Nabil Nedim Eldin. You're watching Africa Live. Time now to catch up with the day's business news and Rama joins us with the very latest. That's right, Benina. Here's what's coming up in business. South Africa's central bank is raising concern about a much faster than forecast pace of debt accumulation. And we'll explore why Nigeria's partial closure of the border with Benin has disrupted trade beyond rice in the region. Africa is the nexus of enterprise, and global business will tell you why it matters. From the mega investment projects to multi-billion dollar mergers and acquisitions. Africa today collects, just in terms of revenues from taxes alone, $545 billion a year. If you take 10% of that and you devote it to the energy sector, problem solved. All this on Global Business, weekdays at this time on CGTN. Africa Live. Find your voice. Right then, a very short business segment for you. Let's start in South Africa. The Reserve Bank over there says the state is borrowing at a significantly faster pace than forecast in February's budget. In a quarterly report released on Wednesday, the Reserve Bank says that the public debt levels were equivalent to about 58.3% of GDP by the end of June. That was well above the February budget projection of 56.2%. 
for the end of the 2019-2020 fiscal year. Now, the increase in debt levels has been driven by a number of factors. Weak economic growth is one, funding a much wider fiscal deficit, and of course, higher government expenditure due to the additional taxpayer-funded bailouts that have been granted to ESCOM. Over in West Africa, Nigeria and Benin are embroiled in a trade dispute of their own after Nigeria's head of state, Muhammad Buhari, ordered the partial closure of Nigeria's border with the country last month. Nigeria's intent at the time was to stop the smuggling of rice and other commodities into Nigeria, but the policy has now gen affected general trade. Benin is a key transit route for traders since it allows her landlocked neighbors to use its harbors to bring in imports and to ship their exports in turn to global markets. Factories and traders are now struggling to just be able to import key raw materials and they're having to use alternative routes. Units of multinational companies like Unilever are in talks with the Nigerian government to find a mutually agreeable solution. In East Africa, global investors in the hotel industry are meeting in Ethiopia to discuss the performance of the sector on the continent. The Africa Hotel Investment Forum has been held every year for the last three years in a bid to connect international hotel franchises and business leaders to local markets. CGTN's Koleto Anjohi filed this report. International investors in the hotel industry meeting in Addis Ababa say they have more interest in expanding in Africa. Driving that interest is the realization there aren't enough quality hotels across Africa to meet demand. Eight out of ten fastest growing economies across the world are in sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, the tourist arrival numbers have shown consistent growth and they are projected to grow at 4.4% over the next 15 years. So the potential is tremendous. There is, we're seeing increased growth in infrastructure spending by governments across Africa. There is growth in the middle class and there is growth in international tourist arrival. So great potential of the market and we want to be part of that. But statistics from STR, a company that tracks supply and demand data for multiple market sectors, says there are only 5,000 hotels in Africa. Just a handful of African nations host international hotel brands. These include Kenya, Morocco, Tunisia, Egypt and South Africa. These hotel investors from different parts of the world are discussing how they can tap into this open market. Their forum is open to all willing investors. The most important question is whether it is being built here in Ethiopia and managed by Ethiopians or somewhere in Africa or being, being managed by an African. The question is that do the management company has got all the right skills to really manage, to provide, to compete with the globally known brand names. But hurdles like delays in government approvals, access to finance, high construction costs and severe power instability are delaying investments. Ethiopia, for instance, has fewer than 10 international brands of hotels. This means local businesses are able to attract international customers. When Union Restaurant in Addis Ababa opened seven months ago, the target was Ethiopian customers, but it realized there was more demand from foreigners. Let's have a look at it. Like, for example, we're not very far from the, from the uh, Bola International Airport. We do get sometimes guests who are coming in for, or, or on transit. Uh, they have maybe two or three hours before they get into their next flight. We do get those kind of guests uh, which come in and uh, have a good time, uh, enjoy. Maybe it could, be, could it be lunch, could it be uh, a dinner before getting back to the airport and traveling to their final destination. So if you look at it in that way, there's plenty of, of, of potential. According to Calibra Consultancy, a firm that links Ethiopian investors to international hotel brands, the presence of African Union and the United Nations offices in Addis Ababa means bigger brands are pushing for faster expansion and Ethiopia continues to be an attractive location for conferences. The firm says at the end of this conference, Ethiopia expects to get at least four new deals from international hotel chains. Koleton Johi, CGTN, Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. One last story for you, this time about Volkswagen. Its uh, legal woes just keep piling up. This week, German prosecutors charged the automaker's two highest-ranking executives, its CEO and its chairman, with stock market manipulation. Prosecutors essentially allege that the current CEO, Herbert Dies, the chair, Hans Dieter Porsche, and the former CEO, Martin Wintercon, failed to inform shareholders of an investigation in the U.S. that led to the company's conviction, essentially, for cheating on emission standards. Now, the announcement is yet another setback to the German car maker, which has been trying for years now, ever since 2015, to refashion itself as a climate-friendly manufacturer of affordable 
fun electric cars. VW is tackling other lawsuits around the world as well, which allege that affected vehicles were fitted with illegal emissions cheating software running their diesel engines. It reached a multi-million dollar settlement with VW owners in Australia. However, the company is now fighting a similar case in its home country, Germany. We want swift proceedings. It doesn't help anyone if the trial is unnecessarily long. The class action suit is new. It's new for the court, for the plaintiff, and also for us. That's why we're counting on a long trial. Up to this day, hundreds of thousands of clients still drive their cars. We therefore believe that no damage was caused and that there's no reason for the lawsuit. And I'll leave you there for the time being. I'll be back at the top of the hour, though. We'll be looking at South Africa. Its unemployment rate may be at an 11-year high, but the job cuts still co keep coming, essentially. Sibanya Stillwater, the miner, now wants to cut over 5,000 jobs as it tries to restructure the loss-making mine in Marikana. We'll explore that live from Johannesburg at 1800 GMT. See you then. For now, though, on to Penina. Thank you, Rama. You're watching Africa Live Still Ahead. We take you to the streets of Tanzania for a quick snack of French fries rolled in fried eggs. Join us in global business and see Africa through our eyes. Africa Live. Find your voice. In Tanzania's major towns, the chips mayai is the quick, easy-to-make snack that is a favorite for many. The French fries mixed with eggs, street meal, is found in almost all corners of the country. Although the origins are not yet known, it, is, it has been a street delicacy for decades. CGTN's Daniel Kijo tells us how it's made. There is not one but two chips my eye meals being cooked over here. The gentleman behind me is turning around and flipping a meal that we really like in Dar es Salaam called chips my eye, or on the street sometimes nicknamed zege. It is a combination of French fries uh, mixed with some eggs that are cooked together. And sometimes you can add uh, different ingredients to spice up the meal. So let us see how chips my eye are made. You take two eggs, break them into a bowl and mix them thoroughly. Then you take your french fries and put the fries on in the pan. You pour your beaten eggs into the fries, you let it cook, then turn it and fry it on the other side as well. Once both sides are nice and cooked, you put it on a plate and serve. Now that we know exactly how chips maya are made, I'd like to have a taste of my very own. Thank you, Chef Simon. Now, what you might notice about the chips maya is that it is rich in french fries, as you see, and we have the eggs there and homemade or, um, uh, natural uh, pili pilis grinded there and a bit of tomato. Mm. As always, it never fails and almost anyone can make it. Um, well, it's, um, it's very easy. It can, it's, if I need a quick snack, I can always get it anywhere, anyhow, and it's uh, quite delicious actually, <laughs> if you ask me. Well, first it's convenient and we are used to it since we are very young, but it's kind of delicious, but I would advise for someone who is in diet, <laughs> you shouldn't have <laughs> to take it because it has a lot of calories. It's in calories, huh? Yeah, calories, and you'll get fat easily if you eat a lot of it. And coming up in sports. Uganda flags off its first batch of athletes for the Doha 2019 IAAF World Championships. Africa, where champions are made, records are broken, legends are born. We're there for every goal, for every knockout, for every step of the way. Match point, only on CGTN. Africa Live. Find your voice.
Uganda has flagged off its first batch of competitors to the Doha 2019 Ball Championships, with the East Africans entering the biggest contingent to the event of 22 athletes. 5,000 meters runner Stephen Kisa received the flag on behalf of the team before their departure from Kampala. A monkey six member early delegation are women's 10,000 meters Commonwealth gold medalist Stella Chesang and national 800 meters record holder Lenny Shida. Joshua Cheptegei and Jacob Kiplimo are among the favorite rights to win a medal in Doha and have been training in Europe ahead of the biannual track and field showpiece. Uganda only managed one silver medal at London 2017, a tally the class of 2019 won to improve on. I know in Doha we shall do it good because the qualification standard was hard and we make it. The first world event to appear in that so all I just want to say is I'm going there to do my best and I want to run, if possible, to run a PB that's a personal best wherever I'm going for these games. Newly re-elected president of the International Association of Athletics Federation, Sebastian Coe, has confirmed that extra medical teams will be in attendance for marathon runners and brace walkers at the World Athletics Championships in Doha, Qatar. With braces starting at around midnight, temperatures are still expected to be in the region of 32 sure, degrees I'm Celsius with 80% humidity, which Coe admitted was going to be tough for the athletes. The championships start on Friday with most track and field events taking place at the air-conditioned Al Khalifa Stadium. Look, you know, of course I want as many people to finish in good shape as possible. Our medical teams are going to be very alert to that. And yeah, you know, it, 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 heat is actually, if I'm being tough here, heat is not the big issue, clearly humidity. You know, anybody that's run or competed knows that actually you can deal with heat, but humidity is, is really a challenge so we will watch all those metrics we do have extra precautions we do have extra stuff out on the course more medical support more water um, but yes it, it is going to be tough it is going to be tough Tonga has been rocked by injuries ahead of their second 2019 Rugby World Cup match against Argentina. The Islanders have lost influential player Nafi Twitavake, who suffered a broken arm, and Kath Morath, who is due for surgery.